Today I'm going to be looking at The Comedy of Manners, which is a play, novel or film that gives a satirical portrayal of the behaviours of a particular social group. This is also known as Restoration Theatre and occurred in England between 1660 and 1710. This was known as the Restoration Era as he and Charles II had returned from exile to take over the rule of the Puritan Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell had been running the country prior to this and his Puritan ways led him to believe that things that we see as fun to be sinful. This led to the banning of sports, music and the arts. Meanwhile, Charles II was living it up in France, drinking nice wine, eating lavish food and really embracing the French culture. This means that when he returned, there was a change to society as a whole, especially those in the higher classes. He brought this French culture with him. Men became openly uh, more metrosexual and more openly flamboyant, uh, meaning that we had a more free and liberal society. This is shown through the new clothes they were wearing. Men decided to spend more on their clothes and try and, find the, try and buy the best that they could have, shown through the change in dress, um, as shown here with these new bright colours. Theatre and the arts became huge. Um, Theatre was seen as a social event for many. There was a newfound passion for it. Social classes were shown um, particularly in the theatre, as what we know as the stalls, down here, were known as the pit. Here were the cheapest thick seats in the theatre. Round the edges, the boxes were the most expensive. Here, the, most expensive, the, the richest people would sit in all their fineries, with all their jewels, and the people in the pit below would be able to look around and glance at what they were wearing. So people would go into the theatre in a boastful manner to show off what they had. This in advanced, as some plays even had the offer of the richest people sitting on the front of the stage. So you weren't just watching the actors, but you were also seeing A, who the richest people in the theatre were, and B, what they were wearing. As this progressed, some plays even had the option of people of the richest people parading along the stage during the intervals to show off their fineries, much like a catwalk, meaning that you'd always be able to see the latest trends and what the best jewellery was by going to the theatre. This meant that there was a need for theatre to be convoluted and satirical, so it could be easily understandable for an audience where theatre was often their set or their drama on stage was often their second motivation. People saw theatre as more of a social outing than for the drama. Therefore, they made plays about the rich for the rich. Why was there a need for it to be understandable and simple? This was because of the promiscuities that happened at the theatre as well. Antonio Fraser writes that, unlike other kings, Charles II was more interested in sex than marriage. And therefore, this then filtered through to other people in society, especially those in the higher social classes, so in those who attended theatres. Therefore, prostitution was rife in theatres, as men came not to watch the drama, but to see the loose woman that was on offer. As well as this, there was other distractions from a newfound fruit that had just entered the UK. This was the orange. This new, f this new fruit um, was exciting to many people, especially those in the higher classes who were able to afford it. Therefore, orange sellers, much like prostitutes, done the majority of their trade in a theatre for the people who... Uh, to those top people in society. This meant that the um, main aim of theatre was to grab the audience's attention and take them away from the distractions of either their shine of their clothes or the prostitutes or the orange sellers. Therefore, the majority of the plots followed a similar line. Therefore, characters would end up in the same places or have the same motivations. This is shown here where um, often in plays that laughter would be directed against the fop or there'd be stories about an old man trying to be young, or an old man with a beautiful woman. Therefore, if one had seen a comedy of manners piece, one would be able to understand all comedy of manners pieces, due to the similarity between each play. The way they created this simple nature was through the mockery of their own culture. What happened was play was satirical, and audience members would be able to identify themselves up on stage. They'd be able to say, there's a character, I'm him, or there's another one, he's like me. They didn't have to be paying attention to know what they were thinking, what they wanted to get out of the play, and what they were doing in certain positions, because it was themselves. Um, therefore, um, as well as these innuendos and immoral things were, were present for the first time in theatre, this closed and very uh, Puritan society beforehand had finally been lifted and changed with innuendos and the sides directed to the audience, as well as the immoral conduct that would happen on stage, such as sex without marriage and affairs. 
Uh, Simon Callow writes that it's a sense of the shackles being thro thrown off, this rejuvenation of the arts that wasn't present before. This consistency throughout each of the plays um, continued into the characters with the evolution of the archetypal and stock character. Characters were seen to be similar throughout each play and often had the same motivations. The name of the character was often used to make it easier for the audience to understand who they were, such as Lady Squeamish or Mr Pinchworth. By doing this, you could immediately identify who everyone was. A key um, stock character was the Rake, who was a carefree, witty and sexually desirable individual. Um, he was said to be representative of the king, and therefore majority of people in the audience would like to be seeing that they were a Rake. For the first time as well, women were allowed to be involved in theatre. They were often put in low-cut dresses with their breasts out in order to appeal to this male audience. So, to keep with these stock character and archetypes, movement was key in uh, comedy of manners, as uh, character stances and positionings were used to be able to be easily recognisable. Audience members would be able to be distracted and engaging in other activities and quickly turn back and be able to comprehend what was happening on stage just by the way a character was standing or the way their hand was positioned because they could identify, yes, that's the rake or yes, that's the flop, uh, that's the fop. Uh, other manners included in their emotions as often characters were, would change their stance to show an emotion. They were sad, they perhaps shy away or if they were happy they'd be big and bold and out to the audience. Therefore, their actions and their emotions were easily identified. Large facial expressions were often avoided as this actually cracked the, make the, cracked the makeup that they were wearing. Therefore, physical theatre was key and their big movements, their body was used a lot in order to A, attract the audience's attention and show who they were. By having big, large movements, you were distracting the audience back from their other activities and actually grabbing their attention. As if I was to stand here and just talk normally, that, that would just be how it normally is. However, if I was to talk like this, that would suddenly grab them's attention, they'd turn their heads and think, what's going on on stage? Should I be watching this? The character I really want to focus on is the fop. The, the fop is, a, is, is the clown of the situation, a camp clown. He's an in, indigenous and grotesque figure who is metrosexual and adapts many of the customs and traditions of this era. He is described to be um, idle, affected, fashionable and ridiculous. But it's to be noted that this is all at a certain level. He's, although he is fashionable, he's trying to be someone he is not. Um, he's often laughed upon by both the characters on stage and the audience, and he's the butt of many jokes. He wants to be someone he's not, he wants to be popular. Therefore, he tries to be fashionable, but doesn't just quite make it, or doesn't wear something in a particular fashion. He talks in a particular way, but not in the way the aristocrats do. So therefore, he was just below the level of society, um, the level of aristocracy in society they were. It's said that he just tries too hard. So the theatrical piece I want to look at is the flop in the relapse, um, and the character Lord Foppington. As previously said, the name Lord Foppington makes it easy, um, easy to immediately identify who the character is. I can look at that name and hear, yes, that's the fop. The piece I'm looking at is this section here in Act 1, Scene 3, where he says, But let my people dispose of the glasses, so that I may see myself before and behind, for I do love to see myself all around. In this scene, he is actually by himself in his room, and he's in his nightgown, and he is talking to himself, pretending what he's going to be, um, trying to be someone he's not. He's practising being an aristocrat and being of that social circle. The comedic value is shown because he's actually bare. He's as, as being in his nightdress. He's not wearing his fine clothes. He's not wearing his jewellery. Therefore, he's taken back someone he's not. His disguise has been lifted and the audience can see him for who he truly is. Jay Awanula says that Lord Foppington is a foolish fop of immortal fame. A selfish creature who refuses to help even his younger brother, infused with ridiculous aristocratical preten pretensions. So, when I first looked at this line, I stood here and said like this, but let my people dispose of my glasses, for, so that I may see myself before and behind. I do love to see myself all around. I just practiced it like I would myself, perhaps hand it into a mirror on stage. But then, as I developed the character and looked into Lord Foppington and the Fopping General, I came across this picture of Coley Kibber, and him playing Lord Foppington. Here you can see he's standing upright with his back straight and his arm up like this, um, in quite a large position, trying to show off to the audience, show off what he was wearing. A key piece is this here, the handkerchief. The handkerchief was key in society at the time, as 
the handkerchiefs were expensive due to the silk and lace that were used to, uh, to make them. Therefore, only the richest people could afford to have a handkerchief. So, by having it at the front of his figure, it's as if he's showing it off, as if, look, I can afford a handkerchief, I can be one of you. So, I adapted my stance of the fop to stand very upright, much like this, to actually sort of copy the image, as this is how he portrays himself. The big actions would be used to attract the audience members, and actually leading with the handkerchief itself. As the research developed, I came across this, uh, this quote from Restoration Comedy and Performance by J.I. Stain, where it says that he had a short steps and a mincing walk. So interpreted it, and watching videos of how the fop would act, I took it and he walked like this, with his forearm there, from there. It's sort of this fashion out to the audience. But I also read that he, has a, he has a turn, much like a cat look at the end, as if showing off his fineries to his clothes. So if I was entry stage, I'd be like this and hand out there, and I'd walk like this, and then I'd show off either side. As if I was trying to be on these high classes, much like bowing when talking or kissing ladies' hands. I leave my forearm with my handkerchief and show myself off. So, therefore, when going back to the line and looking at how it, how it would adapt, I looked at, um, I looked at what, what he would do or how I think he'd portray his character. And I thought that even though he's in his nightdress, he'd still have his handkerchief out. He's trying to pretend he's someone he's not, perhaps looking in the mirror say, saying it, but still leading with the handkerchief. And although he's in his, uh, not in his fineries, he's, his disguise has been lifted, he'd still be, have this large stance to try and attract, uh, try and, and grab attention towards himself. Um, so these big stances would be used to grab Vince's attention. As he's on stage by himself, they might not be paying attention to him, therefore he needs to be loud and directed out to the audience, so they're looking straight at him. Therefore, I changed my, I changed my appearance of it, and this is how I ended up portraying the line. But let my people dispose of the glasses, for I do like to see myself before and behind. I love to see myself all around. That is how my character changed to adapt this uh, character of the fop. But I found a key link between the fop um, in, with Commedia dell'arte. As stock characters were key in Commedia, so that when the troupe travelled around Italy, they'd be easily identified and, uh, throughout each town. Therefore, I feel we really linked in with the inner and morte, who were the lovers in Commedia dell'arte. Um, these were uh, these always led with the arm, had a lot of makeup, and always the butt of the joke. Were very pretentious, much like the fop. The way uh, when doing a workshop at Goldsmiths, I was always told when playing in inner and morte, the lovers, I'd always lead with my arm, as if looking at me, I want to be the centre of attention, leading towards my lover. Therefore, I found a key link to the fop using his um, his arm in front of him with the handkerchief. The other links came in the fact that he wore a lot of makeup, was very uh, cared about his appearance, and the fact that the uh, flop can be seen as the butt of the jokes, he's very dopey, and had both characters on stage and the audience laughing at him, really linked into the lovers, along with the pretension of his character, and the fact that they're often trying to be someone who they're not. So, from studying com uh, comedy of manners as a whole, it's changed me as an actor. I chose it because I was very interested in comedy as a whole, and I like to see how satirical comedy has, has progressed. Satirical comedy is at the forefront of British theatre now, and that is how the majority of the jokes come from taking a mockery of uh, social groups and certain people. Therefore, I wanted to see what started it, what changed theatre from the closed society we had before, and made it more liberal and free, allowing people to be who they want and act who they wanted. And this is where I found comedy of manners. It created a new society and actually developed at the theatre as a whole. It enhanced my knowledge of satir satirical theatre and in whole, uh, enhanced my knowledge of how to grab an audience's attention. As often now in theatre we can use lighting and sound to focus the audience straight onto a character. You just have to stand there and have a light on you and you know you want you. However, this showed me of how, how physical Comedy of Manus Theatre was and how much your body needs to be used in order to grab an audience's attention when they might not be watching you. This is key in immersive theatre, as you may need to grab an audience's attention when they're not paying attention to you. Therefore, develop my acting as a whole, as I could now talk like this. <laughs>